This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas, 75771, or calling 903-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to friends. At this very time, while we're worshiping in Macedonia, at this hour, starting at 10 o'clock our time, remember we, uh, in Macedonia, we, we, we sent over 100 workers uh, after the Serbs had bombed, and they had bombed out a bridge for us. Uh, they connected a whole town with their farmlands across the river. And these were all Muslims, and they told Pastor Carter when he was there that if this church would rebuild the bridge, he could hold a crusade there, and they would bring the whole Muslim town. And so that whole town is meeting right now, and Pastor Carter and our teams are there. And I just got a note before the service requesting prayer at this hour. We're going to pray for uh, our associate pastor, uh, Carter, and our team. We have, I think, 120 or so in Oson Kosovo. We've just sent 12 full-time missionaries there and helping rebuild churches. And would you pray for the teams that are in Macedonia and Kosovo at this time and other parts of the world? Uh, let's believe the Lord now that God will open the hearts of these Muslims. They're wide open. There's never been a better time, and that which was meant for evil, God has turned to good. I want everybody, and, and all of the annexes also, would you please join us in prayer? Now, Father, we pray for the moving of the Holy Spirit. Lord, in this open-air meeting that's happening right now as we stand here, the same Christ that we worship is there, the same Holy Spirit moving among us. We pray, Holy Spirit, you move among them. God, open their hearts. Save many today. God, establish a church in that town. Establish a church through those who be saved today, right now. Holy Spirit, give words. Anoint them. Lord, anoint our teams in Pristina and Kosovo and Macedonia. And, and Lord, all of those Balkan countries. Lord, this is a ripe time. Pour out your Spirit. Lord, let us not be selfish and keep this thing to ourselves, but to go and to preach and to minister. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Pour out your Spirit now, Lord, on Macedonia. Pour out your Spirit, Lord, at that village, that town. Pour out your Spirit upon all the workers and all the pastors in Kosovo, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing among this people. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work around the world. You're doing a marvelous thing on the face of the earth today, and we give you praise and we give you thanks. Now I want you, if you love Jesus and you came to worship, you didn't come to have church, but you've come to seek God. You've come to minister to the Lord. If you're visiting, I invite you to join us, and I want you to do what the Bible says, lift holy hands, and I just want you to thank Him for who He is. And say, come down, Holy Ghost, and meet our hearts. We minister to you now, Lord. We take authority over every principality and power of darkness. Anything that would try to hinder the moving of the Holy Spirit. God, it is your authority. It is not ours. Jesus, stand against the powers of darkness in this city. Break the powers and the chains of darkness. Let the glory of the Lord come down in Times Square. In every church in this city that is proclaiming Christ. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give glory. We give honor. We give praise to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Oh, Lord, send you out just now. Oh. Appropriate song for the message. Our God can fix anything. Father, just about everybody hearing me needs something fixed in their life. Lord, I do. Every pastor, every worker, every visitor, everyone who calls this church their home 
Lord, there are things in our lives that are surrounding us that need to be repaired, restored, healed. And oh, God, give us the confidence that you can restore anything, anybody that we do not give up. Oh, God, touch me. Lord, let the word come with life. Oh, God, we need to hear your heart. Touch me now. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God can fix anything. Remember the story of the Lord appearing to Abraham? He's sitting in the heat of the day at the tent door. He has three angels with him. And he appears to Abraham. Abraham prepares a meal. And uh, the Lord has a little bit of uh, talk with this man. And uh, he says, where's your wife? Where's Sarah? She said, well, she's in the tent. They were at the door of the tent. And he said, well, would you please tell her that she's going to have a child very soon? And God, this is God. Here's Sarah laugh. And he turns to Abraham and said, why is your wife laughing? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? This is God speaking to this man. Evidently, this is long before he learned to walk by faith or she. It's the same question I believe God is asking all of us today. I know he's asked it of me, and when I've answered it deeply in my heart, i found it changes my life and the way I look at ministry and the way I look at people in their needs. And it's simply this. The question is, do you believe God can fix everything that's gone wrong in your life? Do you believe God can fix anything in your family, anything on the job, wherever it may be? Do you believe that God can do the impossible and fix it? Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Now, folks, it's a very simple message God's given me this morning. It's not that we haven't fed you properly over the years here. It's just that I I believe that God knew exactly who would be here this morning and who needed to hear this very simple message. It's so easy to tell others that are going through a hard time how to trust God. We we hear of somebody in trouble, somebody needs something fixed, and they come to us, and you know what we say? Hold on. Don't quit. Don't lose your faith. God can do the impossible. Now, that's very nice. Very cozy, very comfortable to say that to somebody else. But do you believe it for your own life? You see, God's not interested in how well or how how scripturally sound I preach this morning on this subject. He's not interested in the fact that I might be able to provoke you to righteous faith. He's, He's not concerned or impressed in any way how... Fluently, I would be able to preach it and, and you walk out of here and know a thousand people come to me on the street or backstage and say, Pastor Dave, uh, you really provoked me. Things that need fixed in my life and need to be restored. I heard it and I'm going to believe God. Thank you for the word. Now, folks, if I don't believe that in my next crisis, if I don't believe that concerning something in my own life, in my own home, it, it, it's to no avail to me has nothing to do with what I can tell you or what you can tell others in the way of provoking them to believe God that he can fix anything. It's whether you are established in this truth and believe it with all your heart that God can do the impossible in my life and in my family. If you had been living in Sarah's time, you were her friend and you went to her, you know, as Nathan did and and gave a parable to David. David was the man and you, you, knowing... Uh, the promise that God had given to Sarah and Abraham and and you're a dear sister and you go to Sarah and you say Sarah I uh, there's a couple that I know that have a promise that God would uh, give them a child and the problem is they're losing confidence in that dream and that promise and uh, the wife says she's too old because her womb is dead and her husband is not fertile And it's absolutely impossible, humanly, that she can have a child, but she's still holding on to that. What advice should I give her? And I'll tell you, this godly woman would have said, well, please tell her she'd better hold on. Don't let her dream go. Don't let her promise go. Tell her to pray. God can do anything. We do that. Now, don't look at me like you've done that everywhere. Everybody's come to you. What have you told them? 
Hold on. God will do it. And what would you do the first time after that you got in a crisis? God, where are you? You don't really believe in God. You really have no God unless you believe he's the God of the impossible. You don't have a God. If you are going to try to tell me you believe him in all the other areas in your life, but you cannot believe him in the impossible times in your life, you don't believe him at all. That's very, very clear from the scripture. Now, I am not against uh, counseling, Christian counseling. I'm not against the born-again psychologist. I'm not against that because there's been a lot of good done. But let me tell you something. I believe it is absolutely in vain to counsel anybody. Absolutely in vain for anybody to come to me and get any help from me whatsoever unless I first of all believe that every problem that's brought to me, marriage problem, family problem, child problem, whatever it is, if I don't fully believe the moment they walk in the door to sit down on a couch and face me, if I don't, if I'm not fully convinced that no matter what they tell me, no matter what their problem is, I'm fully convinced that God can fix it, that God can work it out. That nothing is impossible. I don't care what kind of bitterness I hear from them, what kind of anger. I don't care if they tell me, well, well usually I get this. And, and any counselor will tell you the same thing. Well, you just don't know what I've been through. You don't know how I'm hurting. You don't know the issues. You don't. If you really knew, you wouldn't be talking as you do. You wouldn't have as much hope as, as you seem to have. But folks, I can't help anybody that ever comes face to face with me with a problem or something overwhelming their life. I can't help them unless two things happen. I have to be absolutely, totally convinced that I cannot give up, that I have got to fight for the marriage. I've got to fight for the victory. I've got to believe God in my heart that he can and that he will. And furthermore, anybody that comes into my office, if you're going to go to any pastor here for counseling, uh, if you're going to the, go to Pastor Rhodes and his wife, if you're going to go to any of our, our counselors in our office in the annex, you're going to come to me and you want to sit down with me. And you, I, want, I want to know the first thing, the first question I ask anymore. Do you really believe that God can restore? Do you really believe God can fix this? And if they hesitate, I know that I'm not going to be able to give them anything that's going to work. There's got, they have to be convinced, first of all, that God is able. That nothing, absolutely nothing in their life is impossible with God. Nothing. And secondly, they have got to want God to do it. Oh, I meet a lot of people that bring to me their marriage problems and it's not more than a half hour into conversation when I know they really don't want it fixed. They just want me to side with them. They've, they've made a good case and they, they, they want the pastor's uh, uh, approval on the direction they've already decided on. You can't be helped by any counselor anywhere unless you are absolutely convinced by the word of God that nothing in your life is beyond God fixing it. And if you tell me otherwise, you really don't want it fixed. You've already made your choice and you're going to go your direction no matter what anybody says. Praise God. All over the nations today, I see Christians, I, uh, as I told you, we have, uh, last count, I think we've done some cleansing, about 800,000 people. Uh, between seven and eight hundred thousand people on the mailing list, and the letters pour in sometimes fifty thousand a month. And it, it's my wife and I are so shocked and heartbroken of the Christian marriages that are breaking up. I mean, all over this nation, folks. I I've had a mailing list for thirty five years, but it has never been like it's been the last two years. It is absolutely frightening and it's overwhelming. Many of my friends in the ministry are divorced or in the process of getting a divorce. Uh, <clears throat> calls, friends that have my personal phone number shock us time and time again because they say we just can't make it. And when I talk to them, 
I, I suddenly find out they really don't believe that this can be fixed. They don't believe their marriage can be healed. They really don't honestly have this, this heart conviction that no matter how bad it's got, no matter what kind of horrible things have been said and the hurts and the wounds, that God is able to restore everything the canker worm has eaten. That which is impossible with man is possible with God. A pastor's wife wrote this past week about her husband who is an habitual liar. He lies in the pulpit, she said, and his lies are so outrageous he's been caught in them and he's been confronted with the evidence right in front of him and still is in denial. His children have no confidence in him. She said, I'm ashamed of him. He stands up and he preaches some powerful message, but the man is, a, is an habitual liar. He can't tell the truth. He doesn't know the truth. And then she says, I, I, I think I'm going to leave him. Now, here's what I wanted to hear from that woman. I, I wanted to hear from that pastor's wife. Uh, yes, I know that this man needs a miracle. I know that there's shame in my heart and my family uh, has airs of dysfunction now because of it. But I wanted to hear from her just something like this. I know that my husband is a liar. And I know the church knows it. And I know he's probably going to lose his pulpit over it. But I serve a God who is able to humble that man. I serve a God who is able to fix this marriage and to save this church. And I wanted to hear the woman that would say, I'm going to hold on from my husband no matter what it costs. I'm going to believe that what God says is true. Now, nothing is impossible with God. That's what I want to hear. In Mark, the ninth chapter, we come against a ghastly situation and one that seems absolutely impossible to fix. You know the story. It's in, found in Mark 9. I'm not going to read the uh, text, but uh, you remember the story. A father brings a demon-possessed son to the disciples to be healed. Now, this was not just a dysfunctional child. This was not a child with a chemical imbalance. This was a demon-possessed boy. And this boy is probably known all over the region. I'm sure, I, I feel confident that the disciples had heard about him. I'm sure uh, that parents who saw the father coming with this child hid their children, took them into the house. They didn't want this child near them. This child was considered absolutely hopeless. The devil would throw him into fires, into waters, to try to drown him and kill him. He would, uh, Satan would manifest, he would foam at the mouth, he would, he would be contorted, and uh, all kind, he was emaciated, had no appetite evidently. The Bible said that uh, he was, it, it infers that he was near death. And uh, what a terrible thing it must have been for the father. It's a full-time job just to hold on to the boy because you go through a neighborhood and the nearest uh, open cooking fire, he wants to leap into the coals. And how many times did the father have to leap into a pond and pull him out, and resuscitate him? And, and what kind of horrible nights and days? Because this father loved this boy or he would not have brought him to the disciples as he did. Uh, because <clears throat> you... you you, you find him broken hearted over the situation. What if this was your son? Uh, or if you're not married, it was your little brother. Uh, to see the burn marks and the bruises on this child and then to stand by helpless where nobody can help him when the devil and the demons in him are manifesting. And this is what the disciples face now. They're looking face to face into a, a hopeless uh, situation as far as man is concerned. Here they are being asked to heal this son, to cast the devil out of this boy. They prayed and nothing happened. I'm sure they prayed again. They may have prayed a long time, but the devil manifested right in front of the disciples and the boy is contorting and he's foaming at the mouth. He's both, he, he, he is deaf and he's speechless and only guttural sounds out of his mouth, most likely. And you talk about a hopeless situation. This is, in, in, in the eyes of man, this can't be fixed. It's impossible. There's been no doctor. There's been nobody can fix this boy. 
Now, this is a simple word, but I want you to see why God included this in the canon of Scripture. Why would God repeat these stories? Why would he move on the hearts of godly, holy men to, to tell these stories? Because what other application can it have other than to teach us? And uh, because it's not just a history book. This is, this is a book that's showing us who God is. And Jesus comes on the scene and he, the scribes now are questioning, is, is this too hard for you? Is your master able to handle every situation but that which is under the influence and power and control of the devil himself? They surely knew this was the devil. They recognized it, as did the Father and all the neighborhood and everybody else. And Jesus comes on the scene. And, and what a sight this must have been. Jesus asked what's going on, and the, they, they said, Well, we brought him to your disciples, and they couldn't heal him. They have, it, it just, it, it's a hopeless case. Uh, and I'm sure some of them had already walked away because uh, nothing was done. Jesus comes on the scene, and he, he, he turns to the Father. He said, Father, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. That's all he said. If you can believe, all things. He's talking about his son. This that's under the control of the devil. This, uh, this harassment in your life. There's nothing impossible with God. If you can believe... It can be fixed. Folks, all it took was a word from Jesus. All it took was a simple word, and the boy fell as dead before that congregation. And they said, he's dead, he's died. What a fix that is. But suddenly the boy answered the cry of the master, stand up, rise. And the boy, I'm sure, ran and embraced his father. Can you imagine the joy in, in that scene? God fixed it. Now, why, does, why is that in the scripture, that story? It is God, it is the Lord saying to every parent listening to me now, who has a child that's gone astray, a family member that is under the manipulation of the devil himself. He's saying, if you can believe, all things are possible. This can be fixed. This can be restored. How many mothers that are here right in this church? I know at least a dozen of you here right now that I've talked to. You get on the bus and you go to upstate New York and you visit your son and your daughter in prison. Some of you in the annex. You and you know the pain of that trip. And you know the agony of sitting there and talking to a boy that was once a tender little boy that you raised. And now because of drugs and because of robbery, he's in jail. And you have prayed... And the devil's trying to tell you to give up. It can't be done because you don't see any evidence. I'm telling you now this is here because God's saying, if you'll keep on believing, if you'll keep trusting me, I can save that boy. He's saying to every one of you mothers that are here, you never in your lifetime could have dreamt that your daughter could ever turn to drugs. She got in with the wrong crowd in high school. She started running these streets. And she became rebellious. Maybe she's had an illegitimate child. But you've seen the changes in her and you can't handle it anymore because she's out half the night. You've had to tell her to leave the house because you didn't want your other children to follow in her footsteps. And you have been on the streets at times and you've seen her get in a car to sell her body to prostitute, to, to, to support her habit. And you've gone home and cried a river of tears and the devil's told you this is hopeless. It can't be fixed. This daughter of yours is gone. It's finished. Folks, I'm telling you, wherever you may, this, this video and this audio goes all over the world. Wherever you will be, I'm telling you, I don't care how low your son or your daughter is gone. I don't care how far gone you think they are. They're not too far gone from God. He can fix it. I've known of fathers... They'd ask him what to do. I said, go, if it's my son, go after him. And I've had fathers just do that. They'll get in the car and they'll go down into the slum somewhere. They'll go down into the ghetto. They'll go to a barrio. And they'll ask around until they find some pusher who knows that boy's name. And, he go, and the father once told me he went in there. 
He walked into a, a shooting den. His son didn't even want to talk to him. His son was emaciated. And he pleaded with his son, come out. Please, I'll stand with you. I'll help you. We'll do anything. Give us a chance. And to see that father come out, heartbroken, out of that shooting gallery, because that boy has turned away and says, I don't even want to talk, talk to you. Get out of the place. This is my life now. And to hear that father say, I lost him. It's hopeless. That boy, folks, we've got a young man in this service today. Uh, from Arizona. Where are you, son? Stand, stand up. Right over here. Just turn a wave to the crowd and say hello. On the streets, given up by society, everybody said he was hopeless. I remember the day I met him. He was still skinny at the time. There was something I saw, and I said, son, you're going to Bible school, and you will preach the gospel. God's going to pick you up and change you. He's pastoring now and head of a drug program in Arizona. <laughs> Phoenix, correct? Yes, sir. Hopeless. God fixed him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh. Say your husband is hopeless, you can't get him saved. You, you say your wife is hopeless, she goes out and parties. Oh, I, I, I know a, a dear man that was here last Sunday. And he, he prayed so long for his wife and God has finally answered the prayer, but he wouldn't give up. How many times... Uh, men have told me I, I had to stay at home and watch my wife come home drunk and, and God just told me to hold on that somehow he would make it up to me if I would believe and trust him and one day God broke through and God saved my wife God saved my husband folks don't give up on anybody don't give up on anything nothing, nothing is impossible with God nothing Let me go a step further. God can bring back to life anything you gave up for dead. Yes, he can. In Mark 5, there's another story of Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue. And he comes to Jesus, fell at his feet and weeping. He said, would you come to my house and lay your hand on my 12-year-old daughter? She's near death. And Jesus agrees to go with the ruler of the synagogue to his home to heal the child, but on the way he is stopped temporarily because a woman with a blood disease touches the hem of his garment. And he just stops and he said, Virtue's gone, and where are you? And, 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 and he's ministering this woman. And while he's ministering this woman, Jairus, Jairus standing beside him, a messenger comes and says to Jairus, Your daughter just died. Don't bother the master anymore. It's too late. And, and Jesus must have seen the fear grip that man, that father who said, if we could have only been there 15 minutes ago, if we could have just, it's just, oh, God, just a matter of timing. And we missed it on timing. And Jesus turns to the man and he says, don't fear. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. Fear not, he said, only believe. Jesus goes with the man, and he approaches the, his residence, and there's a wailing and a weeping and a mourning of neighbors and friends and family. And uh, Jesus comes on the scene. Now, can, can you imagine weeping and wailing in the presence of Almighty God? There he is in flesh. Jesus was God in flesh. Can, can you imagine uh, the unbelief of, of weeping and and what they're saying, and what we say when things have gone too far, we think, beyond possibility. 
uh, what we're saying is, God, you can handle anything. It's still got a little life in it. But when it's totally dead, uh, you don't need to call on Jesus anymore. Many of you have quit calling on Jesus now because you think your situation is beyond possibility. You've already given up, some of you, on your family, given up on your husband, praying him through, given up on your marriage, given up on, on, on something that God told you to hold on for, uh, and, and you've just given up. And Jesus uh, came, came on the scene and, and paraphrased, he said, what's the fuss? What's all this weeping and wailing? They said, well, she's dead. If you, you know, if you had been here, and that's what Moses said, God, if you had just done it on time. I believe in Holy Ghost timing. I certainly do. I believe in Holy Ghost timing. But it's not my time. We always are giving God deadlines. Lord, I believe you. I want it done in the next two weeks. Jesus goes into the room and merely speaks the word. And that little child comes to life. You tell me your marriage is dead? I'll tell you what God has put it in my heart. I am, I am laying hold of God for all my friends that are, that are on the verge of divorce, breaking up. And I am fighting. I am laying hold of God. They may have given up, but I have not given up. And I'm not going to give up. And that should be in you. Divorce should never be an option. Never be an option unless you, your husband's a beater or, or if you've been beaten or something there's a different case you, you, you have to escape that situation and I'm, I'm sure there are other circumstances but uh, why can't you take the hurt take it to Jesus and believe what he said I'm God I'm your God and I can fix it now I, I want everybody hearing me now on the jumbo screens upstairs and here, wherever you are, on video or audio. I want you to listen to me now. The Holy Spirit put this in my heart again this morning before I came to this church to preach. I'm telling you, God's fighting for your marriage. Why aren't you? God is fighting for you. God is on your side. He's trying to heal. If there's something in your heart that's, that, that is hindering, ask God to take it out. And, and if it's going to be healed, it's going to be you that God uses. Because you're here, you're listening to it, and God's delivering the message to you. You be the one. You say, well, it takes two. Yes, it does. But folks, marriage is not 50-50. When marriage is about to break, it's a hundred to nothing. You get nothing out of it but faith in God and let God do it. You don't expect anything in return. You don't expect anything in return. You don't expect to be uh, blessed. You don't expect to be loved. You don't expect anything but to do God's word. Obey him and believe. God, help us. This incredible divorce rate, in, even in Pentecostal churches and Baptist churches, evangelical circles and ministry. God, help us. But we're saying God's a liar. We're saying God's a liar. God can't fix it. You, that's what the scripture... Let me read it to you. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. You can find that First John 5.10. That's why the Holy Ghost included this little story in the scripture. To show you that what you think has died he is able to resurrect... Some have given up looking for a job. Said, I've tried and I've finally given up. I got a letter yesterday from a man on mailing list who said, I've tried everything in his area. a lot of unemployment that I can't find. He literally has given up. No, 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 no. God can fix it. God can do it. One word from Jesus and life springs up again. Uh, I'm going to close in just a few moments, but I've, I've got, I, I, I want to talk about money problems. You got money problems? You got financial problems? You can't pay your bills? Oh, I know somebody said, Oh, Brother Dave, give me something here now that I can lay hold of. <laughs> Did you know Jesus had money problems? Tax collector came. They didn't have the money. And Jesus sends his best fisherman, Peter, out to fish in the sea. And he said, 
tell you what, Peter, you go get your fishing rod, and you go down the sea where you usually fish, and the first fish you catch, open his mouth, and you're going to see a coin there valuable enough to pay all our taxes. And I, can you see Peter, who's fished all his life? He said, this i got to see. <laughs> Tax money out of a fish's mouth. I've seen worms, I've seen hooks, I've never seen a coin, a gold coin or whatever it was, I've never. And I, I'm sure it was great curiosity he went fishing. There's a nibble, and he wills in his first fish. I don't know the size of it or anything else. I, I don't know if God created that coin or whether somebody uh, was there a week ago and God said, I'm going to need this coin, and he... It rolls off a dock right into fish's mouth. God can do it naturally. He can do it supernaturally any way he chooses. All I know is that this was a miracle. When Peter opens the mouth of that fish and looks at that gleaming coin, he said, well, how about that? Isn't that something? What a miracle. What a miracle. To a fisherman, this had to be a great miracle. It's a miracle when I read it. But why would God include a little fish story? Why didn't Jesus, I, I got to think about this this past week, why didn't Jesus take an offering among all those disciples and teach them about giving? Because the Apostle Paul did. Uh, why didn't he send all his disciples out for day work for a day? They could have pay, raised that in one day of day labor. No, because you see, that's all within the realm of possibility. God wanted to do it miraculously to show you and me that there are times in our life that only a miracle will answer the need. Only a miracle will answer the need. I know what you're thinking right now. I need an angel. I need somebody sending an anonymous $50,000 check in the mail. I've got to have that miracle, Brother David. If Jesus can do that for, to pay the taxes, if he can get money out of a fish's mouth, if our God can feed 5,000 and 4,000 with a few fish and, and a few loaves of bread, if he can cause a widow to pour gallons and gallons of cooking oil out of a little pint jug, if he can cause a barrel never to go dry and, and the, the, the oil never to go dry for the widow, if, if, if that's the kind of God, and if God can do anything, then God, I need that miracle. I need a financial miracle. I, I have to tell you a story. I think I may have told it years ago in this church, but it fits the story here right now. Uh, years ago, when I was a young pastor in my 20s, uh, I got in debt for a stupid thing I did. I thought it was God. And in those days, I didn't consult the Lord. I just did it because there was a need. And it was a good project, but I just got $5,000 in debt. And, and today, that, that's like $25,000 or more in today's money. And... and the, the money was due and I I was desperate and so I started reading those scriptures with God nothing is impossible God supply all your need and I was reading these very stories about how angels uh, fed uh, Elijah with uh, a raven and all these miracles that God did I said Lord I need a miracle and in my desperation I now, folks please don't ever go into God's presence and let your mind go blank you open yourself to every conceivable kind of deception. Don't ever do that. If you're there, just worship him. But give him your thoughts. Give him your mind. And I, I just went back and I heard the most beautiful voice I ever heard. David, go down Chester Street tomorrow at noon and uh, walk on the left side between 3rd and 4th. And there's going to be a man come towards you with an envelope. He's going to be an angel. And he's got $5,000 in his hand. And he's just going to put it in your hand. And I thought, oh, glory to God. <laughs> My angel. God, you're faithful. Next day at noon, I'm walking down the street looking every direction. <laughs> Folks. It's a town of 1,200 people. Nobody walks the streets, ever. There's nobody there. Everybody's at work. And there wasn't a soul in sight. I walked it for a half hour, up and down, up and down. 
And I said, Lord, where is he? And, and then a guy comes and, and, and he goes when I knew he wasn't he was smoking and an angel wouldn't smoke. <laughs> and after about 40 minutes, I said, Lord, these neighbors are going to think I'm a robber looking out over and trying to check their houses out. Finally, in despair, I went home. I was so downcast. Lord, now what do I do? I was hurt, was wounded. And most of all, I said, how could I be so deceived? But I, I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I, I, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to put it in your hands. And a day or two later, a man in the church came to me and he said, Brother Dave, I've heard about that need you have. He said, I... I have a friend in uh, another town near here who has a bank. He's a Christian. He's a, a banker. Why don't you go there and tell him I sent you? <clears throat> I said, okay. And I went over and I, I told the banker uh, my problem. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you an unsecured loan for $5,000. You're going to pay it back $50 a month. Folks, God met it. But I walked out. God said, now, I could have sent you that angel. I could have put that in pocket. You'd never learn your lesson. You'd be doing this the rest of your life, and one day you'd be $100,000 in debt. God says, now, you're going to work it off. You're going to pay the $50, and you're going to learn your lesson. Folks, I paid that, that money off. It was a miracle to get an unsecured loan at that time. God has his ways of doing it. Don't you try to figure it out. Don't look for a 90-foot angel. It's going to come around. Uh, uh, don't even look for a midget angel. Don't look for any kind of an angel. My God fixed my problem. And I'm telling you now, and I'm not going to belabor this, I'm not going to go much further, but I'm telling you that God told me to come to you this morning because many of you hearing me have got, you're in the need of a miracle, either in your home, your, your family, your marriage, your finances. And I'm telling you, if you will trust God, the Lord said of the demons, this can't come out. These kind don't come out unless you fast and pray. But the fasting and prayer, I think, was to get the doubt and unbelief out of the disciples. I'm here to tell you that I believe with all of my heart. And I know I'll be tested on what I'm about to tell you. But I believe with all of my heart that there's nothing in my life or my family that God can't fix. There's nothing that he can't restore. In closing, I, I want to read... a. Uh, I'm telling you that God can even fix your sin problem. This is his greatest work. But we get so many like this. Here's a prisoner who writes, Pastor Dave, I'm a sexual pervert. I know I wasn't born that way, but it's what I've become. I've been married three times, and I have four children. The real truth is that I like anything when it comes to perversion. If you can think of it, it's, I've probably tried it. I said, Pastor Dave, if I were to tell you everything I've done, it would take pages and probably make you so sick. And then he goes on, I want to stop and yet I don't. I've pleaded and I've cried and I've begged God for help. I quit smoking cold turkey. That was no problem. I've even been able to stay away from pornography a little, t a little time at a time. I know I can't of my own get away with my habits. I believe in the healing power of God, but it seems I can't find the door to escape. My desire to do the Lord's will is ever with me, and yet I push them aside and I fall back in the lust of my flesh. I've lied to God only to do it over and again. I hurt because I know that I made God sick. When I go to chapel... I feel two-faced because there are men here who respect me because I've given them good advice and not kept it myself. I play the piano in chapel and I sing, but I don't feel right because I am not right. I am in prison for my addiction to sex. I'd rather die and go to hell than ever bother another innocent person again in my life. I hate what I do, and yet somehow I love it. I hate it enough, though, to want out because... I want to serve God, and I want his love, and I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't know what to do.
Folks, I'm saying to this young man that God can fix his perverted mind. God can heal that mind. There, there was a time I gave up on uh, homosexuals that came to me wanted healing because I'd seen so little, uh, so little healing. Uh, we once had a home for homosexuals, and it, it had ended in disaster. And uh, all our drug programs worked, and alcohol, but homosexuality I didn't see the victories. But folks, uh, the Lord began to sh send testimonies to me of those who've been delivered from the worst perversions on earth. Homosexuality. If you have a son or a daughter, or if you're here and you're involved in some kind of perverted activity, uh, and I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'm saying this now, but the time's coming very short in America. I can't talk to you like I'm talking to you now without going to jail. I won't be able to mention homosexuality without being politically incorrect, and uh, I could be sued, and it's come to that in America. But I say it in love, and, and I say it with deep, heartfelt love, that God is able... If you want freedom, if we're not here to condemn anybody into any kind of perversion, and you say, well, don't call my homosexuality perversion. I, I, I am not. The Bible is. The Bible is calling that. Folks, no clapping, please. No clapping, please. But I'll tell you right now, I don't care what kind of habit you have. I don't care what kind of lust has laid hold of your heart. My God can restore you. My God can break that habit and set you free. But you've got to believe with me right now that nothing... And your life is impossible with God. Nothing that's happened. No clutch of the devil that can't be released. I want you to get a hold of faith when I give this invitation today. And I want you to believe God to absolutely change and transform your life. Hallelujah. Will you stand? Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for the confidence that you've placed in my heart and the confidence you want to place in the heart of every believer here this morning. That absolutely nothing that is in my life or that affects my life is impossible with you. You can truly restore and heal and fix everything that's gone wrong. Lord, what a simple word we've heard this morning. And I believe it was from your heart. You knew exactly who would be here. You knew those who are going through the trial of their life. You know of the marriages that are here where there is trouble. God, deep trouble. It can't be denied that the, the difficulty that's come the enemy. There's a sense that the enemy is trying to destroy the home. Oh, God. I don't know why you had me preach this this morning. But I know you knew who would be here. You knew every seat and who would be in it. God, by your spirit, bring hope. Bring restoration. And bring faith that you'll fix it. You'll heal it. You restore it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the annex, I'm going to give an invitation now. And in the annex, those who feel that this message is for you, you've had unbelief and doubt. You have thought in your heart that this is too far gone. There's no hope. I don't know what it is, but I want you, don't go to the screen, but go between the screens, if you will. Just step out, and uh, Pastor Neil Rhodes will be there, and they'll take you into room. And we'll, we have wonderful prayer counselors, and those will minister to you. But you just go forward, and here in the main auditorium, upstairs, you go to the stairs on either side, come down any out. Here in the main floor, the Holy Spirit's talking to you. Said, Brother Dave, this message is for me. This message is for me. If you're not right with God, if you're not saved, if you're backslidden, Come with these that are coming. I'm going to pray and ask God to release you. I'm going to ask God to do this miracle in your life. Now, please don't come if it's, it's, it's a financial problem. We'll pray for you in your seat. We don't try to pack out this altar. Uh, we, we want those who are being dealt with by the Holy Spirit. And if He is dealing with your heart. Some of you are backslidden. Some of you walked in this church today cold. You slipped away. The fire is not burning in your heart anymore. And the Lord wants you to come back. There will never be a better time. 
You're surrounded by people who care. You feel the tug or pull of the Spirit. Don't come unless that tug is there. You feel that pull of the Holy Spirit. Respond to it. Don't reject, don't reject the wooing, the calling, the tugging of the Holy Spirit. Up in the balcony. That's it. Follow those that are going down either side. You come down any aisle and meet me here. We'll be praying in just a moment wherever you're at. Father, find every heart that needs to be fixed. Some that are broken. Some, Lord, that have been wounded. God, heal those wounded hearts this morning. Those, Lord, that are sin sick. They're sick of their sin. God, break the chain that binds them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Come as, as the, they're sick. Please look this way. Uh, you've, you've taken a step. And I'm reminded of what the Father answered Jesus when Jesus said, Only believe. He cried out, Lord, help my unbelief. And I want you to do that right now. You stand before the same Savior and just say, Lord, help my unbelief. Right now, just, just tell him right now, Father, forgive my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Holy Spirit, give me the faith of Christ. Implant in me faith. Implant in me confidence, O oh Lord, because it's, I don't have the ability and the power. Lord, you've given me a measure of faith, but increase that measure that all of us have. Lord, I want to truly believe you for the problem in my life. God, I want, you to believe, I, I want to believe you now on my job. I want to believe you in my relationships. I want to trust you that you'll work out all of these things. I want to find out all of this, even the aisles, wherever you're at, and in the annex. I want every one of you who can honestly say, Pastor David, I need a miracle in my life. Raise your hand, please. I need a miracle in my life. Yes, yes. In the annex. God bless you. God bless you. When God says, he does the impossible, he's saying, I, I do miracles. I do miracles. <laughs> I do miracles. Hallelujah. And he wants to do that for you. You know what the miracle is? First of all, he'll give you peace. That's the miracle in a day when you can't get peace by any human effort. Because the peace, you go right outside here this afternoon in, in the, uh, the afternoon shows, matinees. And you look at the people to come out after paying $70 and $80. You come out, watch those people, see if you can find a smiling face. See if you see anybody has evidence of peace. You can't get it. You can't buy it. That's the first miracle. He gives you peace. When you rest in Him and His promises, if you believe that He's going to work it out and He's going to fix it, you don't tell Him how. You say, Lord, I'm going to believe you and I'm going to wait on you. Now, it may, it, it may take a little time, but God will do it in His time, but it will never be late. It will be just the right time. You believe that even. You believe that right now. Secondly, he'll, he'll, there'll be a still small voice speaking your heart and giving you directions. But he won't do that unless you're in the Word. You're going, to hear, you're going to hear a false voice unless you're saturating yourself with the Word of God. Find it here first. If you don't find it here, the Lord will give you. There will be a word behind you saying, this is the way walk you in it. Someone will come to you. The Lord will drop the Word into your heart. And he'll be faithful to you. Now, I want you to believe God as I pray. Every one of you. And in the annexes, I want you to believe God with me right now. That when you walk out of this church, you carry with you an absolute confidence that God's going to fix that thing in your life. Whatever it may be, God's going to fix it. Only Father, I take your authority now in Jesus' name over the principalities and powers of darkness arrayed against all your people. And I pray for those that have come to be restored. First of all to you and then to someone else that they need to be restored to. Father, I pray that you come now and you implant by your Holy Spirit confidence and faith in your word. Lord, we believe you in this church. We believe you've told me not to not to have a, a bit of doubt, no matter how sick, no matter how how horrible it looks, no matter how ghastly it looks, no matter how hopeless it looks, to hold on and believe God in the face of it. I want you to pray this with me right now. Jesus, first of all, I, I'm, I'm going to ask, I'm, 
Hey, look at me. You've got to pray this from your gut. It has to come from your gut inside. Amen. Say it right out loud. Jesus. I can't do it myself. But I came down this aisle. And I came to you here now, Jesus. Because I have to have a miracle. Jesus, cleanse me. Forgive me. Heal my spirit. And all my wounds. And all my hurts. I laid them on you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come now. I need faith. Take my unbelief. And remove it from my heart. So that I can truthfully say. I'm committed. To God restoring. Everything in my life. I love you, Jesus. And I give you thanks now. In advance. Now just thank him. Just give him thanks. Just give him thanks. Lord, I give you thanks. I give you thanks. Now I want to pray for all of you that have unsaved loved ones. I want God to, to come to you now. I, I Honestly, I feel in my spirit. I don't know this to be a fact, but it, it, I, I gather that from the talk I hear from people, what I see and what I hear, and what I hear from the Holy Spirit, that a great majority of Christians have given up, literally given up, praying and believing God for their unsaved loved ones. I'm asking you right now to get a hold of faith and say, God, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to believe you for the salvation of my entire family and those that you've been praying for in your relationships that God will save. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray a prayer of faith now that you will cause a tide to rise up in our hearts of faith that we will believe God for what seems to be impossible. Lord, for unsaved children. Unsaved husbands, unsaved wives, fathers and mothers. Lord Jesus, you said thou shalt be saved in thy house, and I believe what you said. I believe that and I receive it. Lord, answer this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Let's sing, Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. Do you know that one? Lord, I believe. Okay. I don't want to have to lead this. My voice. You don't want to hear it. All right. Lord, Lord I believe. Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. Please don't forget, in the annex, go to room 204. And here in the main auditorium, the stairs and down, go through exit 8 and 9, down here to my left and your right. And... Uh, I believe we have some uh, Assembly of God pastors. I'd like them to go backstage and meet me uh, right after service here now. Would you turn around to 10 people and say, God can fix it? Come on, just say, God will fix it. God will fix it. God will fix it. 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock. God bless you and be with you. Uh, I praise you. I praise you.